Hello and welcome to another episode of the Wellbeing in Education podcast. In these episodes, I get to talk to people from across Suffolk who are working to support wellbeing in education in interesting and exciting ways. Today, I'm speaking to three of my wonderful colleagues from the Suffolk Psychology and Therapeutic Services, who have recently spent a lot of time developing some resources around emotionally based school avoidance, which is also known as EBSA for short. The resources that they've produced are absolutely fantastic and are freely available for anybody who would like to access them. Towards the end of the episode, Kelly talks about where they can be found and there will also be a link underneath the video version of this podcast on Suffolk County Council's YouTube channel so you can find it there if you need to. So without further ado, over to my guests to introduce themselves. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I wonder if you could start by introducing yourselves please. So Kay, over to you first. Good morning. Uh, Yeah, so my name's Kay Breton and I'm one of the educational psychology team based in Ipswich uh, and I have a specialist role in uh, whole school approaches that support mental health and well-being. Thank you Kay and then over to Kelly. I'm Kelly Francis, I'm a senior inclusion facilitator with the inclusion facilitation team as part of psychology and therapeutic services and we work um, across Suffolk with children, young people, their families um, around their emotional needs and well-being. Uh, Thank you, Kelly. And Susan? Hi, my name is Susan Hunter and I'm one of the educational psychologists and I'm based in the Bury St Edmund office. Thank you. So uh, you've all recently been working together around the topic of EBSA, EBSA. So how did that come about? Well, uh, we alongside other LEAs around the country were allocated a government fund to help meet the needs of pupils in the county that might have arisen as a result of the pandemic or been exacerbated by the pandemic under the heading of wellbeing for education return. Um, So mental health needs relating to anxiety have understandably risen. Um, I think they were there already, but they've certainly risen as a result of the pandemic. Um, And we've become aware via conversations with schools and other professionals and other services that one related consequence of that has been a large number of children exhibiting EBSA. And so that target group really became a natural focus for our uh, our funding. Okay, so um, how would you explain EBSA to someone who'd never heard of it or heard of that? So EBSA stands for Emotionally Based School Avoidance. Um, And it's a term used to describe a group of young people who have severe difficulty due to emotional factors Um, often resulting in prolonged absence from school. It used to be referred to as school refusal, but that really gives the wrong impression that somehow it's a choice the young person is making, when very often it's around extreme or overwhelming anxiety, so that avoiding school really becomes a coping strategy for children and young people who find being in school really difficult. Um, There are lots of different reasons for that, and often it's a combination of factors. Um, There might be social anxiety, perhaps around fear of rejection or ridicule, um, loneliness. There may be anxiety around learning, so learning difficulties or fear of failure or perhaps letting other people down. Um, And those around kind of health anxiety, so maybe difficulties coping with the sensory side of school or perhaps around loss, change and uncertainty. Um, And those things have obviously increased during the pandemic. Um, And while some people avoid school completely, so are absent. Others force themselves into school, but they may not be able to cope with certain lessons or going into certain parts of the school. Susan, so it sounds like that one term, EBSA, covers lots of different things um, and can look very different perhaps in, in different children and young people. Uh, tell me a bit about some of the EBSA resources you've produced um, and what that process was that you went through in creating those. Okay, so I'll, I'll kick off because I was given um, the role of coordinating information um, for schools at um, the more kind of systemic level. So myself and several other colleagues from um, a whole range of different services, so the Standards and Excellence team were represented, um, the County Inclusive Support Service were represented and there were several other schools around Suffolk who um, very generously kind of lent their time to this project. Um, So we collaborated over half a term to share ideas to read through the research and uh, as well as guidance produced by other authorities on the topic of EBSA. And then from this we kind of noted down what we felt were the key messages for us in Suffolk in terms of preventing EBSA at a whole school level 
and also then in terms of responding to EBITDA once it had become a pattern of behaviour. And then from that, we try to produce what we hope is a reasonably accessible document um, for all setting staff, giving a summary of sort of key bits of research and then um, practice guidance around the role of education settings and how they can prevent and address EBITDA. I had the job of, of sort of coordinating um, a small group and that was to pull together some resources for children and young people. Um, and again, like, uh, like Kay's group and as Kay's mentioned, we had colleagues from a range of different teams. So we had a clinical psychologist from Suffolk Family Focus. We had um, someone from education attendance. We had uh, representatives from the engagement hub, including uh, sort of a young person, young adult representative. And the aim was to provide materials that would help explain EBSA to young people what it was, what it might feel like for them, and some of the things going on for them that might be adding to their anxiety around school. But as well as helping them to explore it for themselves, the resources are really there to help them to be able to express those feelings to other trusted adults, be that parents and carers or school staff, who hopefully will then understand the young person's situation better and can tailor the support that they offer. Um, as Kay said, we, we looked at resources from many different local authorities in different areas and um, we got permission from West Sussex to use their EBSA materials. And then in our group, we went through those that were relevant for children and young people to make sure that the language was suitable, that the examples were accessible and that the formatting would kind of look familiar to people who use our materials. So they've been produced with the sort of graphics that you'll see on our other materials, things like from the in, uh, Inclusion Facilitator Service. We're also still working with Engagement Hub and they are taking these resources out to focus groups with young people so we can get their feedback, for example, again, on the, the language and format on, and kind of on their accessibility, how they would access them. And then Kelly, I think you've done a little bit of work with families as well. Yeah, so um, similarly, I was um, asked to coordinate the group that would be focusing on the supportive materials for families um, so that we could provide um, materials to explain and recognise EBSA um, and what the families themselves can be doing to support the child um, themselves as well and a way give them ways to discuss their concerns with schools. So we also had colleagues from different areas um, in our group um, from Suffolk Parent Forums um, in addition to Suffolk Sendias to ensure that what we were creating was both useful for families, it was accessible, um, it was practical. And um, again, the inclusion facilitator team, as, as Susan said, we created some materials using kind of particular graphic style known as the five tips series um, that was aimed at children and young people and their families um, offering tips in a range of well-being areas as part of our previous response to the pandemic. Um, and in recognition of particular work around EBSA, the team co-produced a specific series focusing on EBSA with um, the then Suffolk Parent Carer Network, um, where we were able to get feedback from them on what was working well and what was being um, needed for, for the families in this area. Because um, it, in our group, we found that it was really important to recognise that families were often doing um, a lot of uh, work already with their children around um, those emotional difficulties about being in school. So we wanted to make sure that what we were doing uh, in our work recognised that but and acknowledged that, um, but also gave them pathways to be able to access supportive materials from the work that Susan was doing and um, how to have those conversations with school through the work that Kay was doing. So. Um, we then used, again, the West Sussex guidance um, and some from other local authorities, but predominantly the West Sussex guidance um, as the basis for our work. And then again, as Susan said, we kind of expanded and refined it um, where needed to kind of reflect our local community's need. Um, yeah, using that familiar formatting style. Fantastic. So it sounds like you've been able to draw on the wealth of expertise that's already out there from colleagues in other parts of the country, but then bring it into the context of Suffolk and, and make it work for the people here. Brilliant. When you've been um, working with other professional groups and colleagues in schools, and Kelly, you just touched on, you know, families already having an awareness of, of the needs of children regarding EBSA. 
what have you kind of found, um, so colleagues in schools and other professional groups, what has their understanding already been of EBSA? Has it been a completely new idea for them or something they already had awareness of? Yeah, I think because um, it was, it started off as kind of a, a task and finish group. So people who came to that group had a particular interest and often a passion in it. Mm -hmm. So they did bring experience already. Um, and as we said, we had a range of people there. So we had people there, for example, from Education Attendance Service. So they have a lot of experience of supporting children um, who have difficulties getting into school for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. So I think we probably had a pool of people who already had an interest in it and some knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think now it's about taking that out as well for other people, so other staff in schools who maybe aren't so familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's hopefully what these resources will do. will give people who may not have come across it before um, or who might have in their head that idea of school refusal. It might um, give them another sort of perspective on how to see the problem and then what they could do to support a young person in that position. As Susan was saying, with the materials that we've created, um, our focus as well was in order to give the families um, a shared language with school and being able to um, feel confident that they would be able to be heard in a way that um, acknowledged maybe the struggles that they'd been going through probably for many months before school might have even become aware that there were difficulties around being in school um, and to feel confident that they could have those kind of conversations in a way that um, acknowledged both the young person's viewpoint but also theirs as a family as, as perhaps struggles um, already and being able to um, use Kay's work to be able to give school that knowledge of what this actually um, can mean for both children and their families. That sounds like a real strength of your work that because you have co-produced it with families and young people you're really getting their voice in there and that's going to be so valuable as you say for helping schools to see their perspective. So how would you say that the pandemic has affected things for children and young people and schools and families in terms of um, EBSA? I think the first thing to recognise is obviously the pandemic hasn't been the same for everyone. And for a few children, lockdown was a benefit as that pressure of having to attend school was taken away. But for many, if not most young people and families, the uncertainty and change has been very stressful. Um, and now schools have returned fully, even those who maybe were feeling some temporary respite are also having to return. And there were lots of changes during lockdowns and during the returns about how schools operated. So things like bubbles and staggered start times and break times. And for many young people experiencing EBSA, that stopped them from accessing the supports that school usually provide. Mm -hmm. What we do know is that requests for support from organisations that support young people with EBSA have massively increased. And all the different staff and specialists I talk to in my role kind of report anecdotally that anxiety around school and trouble getting into school and really taking part in school life. Um, many more children and young people are struggling and schools are having to cope and find ways to support those young people. And I'd say we're in the inclusion facilitator team. We're also seeing and hearing very similar to that. And we recognise that it's challenging at all levels to kind of hold in mind the different ways that individuals, families, schools, um, young people have been impacted by the pandemic in whatever way that that might be. Um, and that, as Susan says, for some it made things better initially, then it's made it much harder again now. But also I think there are also children that maybe were were coping okay before but that they also now are finding all of these um, changes and further uncertainties linking into some of these um, areas that EBSA encapsulates. Yeah so as you say it's not a one-size-fits-all thing it's going to be very unique how every young person or child experiences this. Yeah. So how do you think that um, EBSA ties in with wider well-being in education? So I think that good practice as a whole school level that seeks to look after the well-being of all its staff as well as all its pupils is what we're basically all striving for um, and that where that's done well there are likely to be far fewer cases of EBSA possibly from staff as well as pupils um, but that's not to say of course that EBSA never happens in a school that kind of gets it right um, but I think what we're saying is that in schools where there's a robust ethos that's based on prioritising well-being and where there are strong systems in place to support um, this, EBSA will probably be less prevalent and where it does happen, it'll be more easily recovered from. 
Mm. So with that in mind, we're looking to further develop our guidance around whole school approaches to supporting well-being. And you will see a few changes to our web pages to reflect that and also our training offer. So we're offering training at the moment um, to all schools in Suffolk on something called Keys to Inclusion, as well as to um, schools on restorative justice, which are both um, two approaches that really exemplify that kind of good whole school approach to promoting well-being. Um, and do you think there are any implications for staff and family well-being if a, a child or young person is experiencing emotionally based school avoidance? Yeah, I think there's um, the implications for it is that because it's not um, perhaps their experience, there needs to be sort of a level of acceptance of the young person's um, own experience so that we can um, listen to how they're feeling and how they're not just how they're feeling, but also how they are viewing it and experiencing um, their difficulties and um, being able to acknowledge that even if we don't necessarily agree with them that is their experience so we can have ways to um, to support that through using our you know relationships and our connections um, in school not just in the different roles that we have but everybody uh, across the school has that role to play so that they might have um, a good close relationship for example with the um, front office staff that greet them every day um, that might be somebody that um, they actually don't see that often but actually makes a real difference to them in school so it's being able to um, acknowledge that there um, that there are sort of systems and things that need to be in place but also there's those daily um, much smaller connections and opportunities for um, the relational experiences that can support and reduce um, feelings of anxiety around being in school, accessing different areas and aspects of school and learning um, and, and providing families with the reassurance that they know the young people, uh, the staff in school know the young people and the young people have those um, people that they can they can reach out to and be supported by. So as you say, Kelly, those relational factors and those kind of connections with people at school can be a huge supported factor, it sounds like, for young people. Yeah. And I think as well, the other thing is for staff to know that they're often going to be doing a really good job already and being able to know their children and know what's needed. But they also need to be supporting, uh, have space to support each other and be reassured that there will be a lot of difficult things going on out there still as um, the pandemic isn't quite isn't quite finished yet um, and that there's still things that they need to be making sure that they're taking care of themselves and um, looking out for each other as well um, in in their work because it can be very difficult to support young people who are struggling with these types of difficult feelings around anxiousness and um, yeah difficulties like that. So as you've been going through this project, have you encountered any hurdles or any barriers um, uh, or have you had any sort of high points or any favourite moments while doing this work? Um, I guess for me personally, the, the high point was getting to work alongside such a broad group of people who all share a passion for children's mental health and well-being. And we've talked quite a lot about working with different organisations and different agencies and different uh, colleagues. As EPs, we often work on our own. So it was lovely to be part of a working group and, and not just with other psychologists. Um, we wanted it to be a real co-production of resources. And we had people on the group from parent and carer organisations, school staff, other education professionals, psychologists, education welfare. And we've already listed some others. Um, and in terms of barriers, I think it's more that we had to sort of start somewhere and so we know there's still work to do uh, there are still other people who we hope to link into this work getting their views and making use of their expertise we know there's some local research going on with some of the, um, the trainee educational psychologists who are interested in this area so there may be more research coming online that we can also make use of and also as I mentioned earlier we are still working with the engagement hub who are taking these resources out to children and young people and we are trying to incorporate their views and feedback and as Kelly mentioned it's important that we we try and see things from their perspective the perspective of the children the young people and the families themselves and we know that we need to make the materials more accessible for children and young people too but I'm afraid Alice that involves technology platforms that are beyond what I'm familiar with and so I'm hoping people like you 
will be able to help with that part. Yeah, definitely. We can uh, all work together, can't we, to find ways of making it really accessible, really engaging for young people. Um, So what do you think school staff can practically do to support children and young people who might just be beginning to show some signs of emotionally based school avoidance? Have you got any kind of top tips? I think one of the um, key things is is to just be aware of how broad EBSA is and how uh, and what those early signs can look like um, and be thinking about those opportunities for, you know, checking in and and, um, looking out for um, particularly vulnerable children, but also just children who seem a little different to to how they maybe um, were previously in school if you knew them well before then so um, that would be sort of my first starting thing I think. Mm -hmm. I'd follow on from that just saying that um, I think research has shown that it's frequently the kind of favoured friendly teacher who is the first port of call when children are wobbling a little bit emotionally so even in schools where there are a host of different pastoral staff there are Thrive practitioners, school counsellors and so on it's very often that kind of favoured class teacher that the child feels they have some kind of uh, more embedded relationship with who they'll turn to first even if that person may then kind of signpost them on elsewhere so I think for those those staff uh, for those people who do have the the privilege of kind of being those kind of frontline workers if you like um, just being kind of quite self-aware of when when pupils approach um, wanting to talk um, just being as as far as uh, the day-to-day schedule allows sort of available and approachable and able to actively listen Um, but also as Kelly said also being the first ones to notice when patterns of behavior um, are perhaps beginning to change a little bit so the pupil who um, did have good attendance maybe last year has suddenly begun to um, be a little bit late in the mornings or pupils are a bit quieter than usual a bit louder than usual bit more distracted or solitary than they would usually be just it sounds like a big ask I think when you've got a class of 30 students in front of you but I think um, that would be the ideal because obviously um, early intervention always enables better outcomes so um, once EBSA has become a very ingrained pattern of behavior it's quite difficult to shift and I think we're recognizing that that's a a big ask it's a, a, a very kind of sustained committed approach is needed to shift that pattern once it's become very embedded um, so also within our resources we've put together a few kind of quick read top tips sort of following Kelly's uh, an acute conclusion facilitator team kind of um, pattern of top tip pages for for school staff on topics such as supporting transition building resiliency again with a view to really trying to think of how we prevent this pattern of behavior becoming embedded Um, really emphasising that preventative practice angle. Excellent. So if there was someone listening now who was a a member of staff in school and kind of wanted a starting point to maybe begin that conversation with a young person or a family, it sounds like your resources are a really good place for them to go to get some ideas and reassurance about how to begin that conversation. So if someone wanted to go and find all these amazing resources, where would they need to go? Uh, So we have a web page that is on the Suffolk County Council um, website and it can be found under the children and families and learning um, area um, within psych- within education, well-being and education. Um, so maybe we can um, include a link somehow uh, for, yeah. for people. But um, yeah, it's got a, a range of different um, resources and supporting materials on there um, under the page of EBSA. So um, there are... Um, the, and, the, and the tools that we've created, as I think Kay and Susan did say um, earlier, they are a kind of a starting point. We've had to keep them quite generalised because they're, they're for people to be able to personalise to the young people that they're either working with or um, that, that, you know, their own children in, in families because um, everybody's uh, interests and um thoughts on how things should look are so diverse and different that we wanted them to have something to to be able to get started with and so it's got those core underpinnings of the research that we've looked at and the the other guidance that's out there but it's um yeah it's it's a starting point for everyone I think 
Okay, well, thank you so much for um, talking to me today and sharing your expertise and um, talking about the amazing resources you've produced. I'll make sure that there is a link to those with this podcast so that people can find them really easily. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So that's it for this episode. I hope you found the conversation helpful. And if you would like to have a look at the resources, you can find them by searching online for Suffolk EBSA resources, or you can click on the link underneath the video if you're watching this on YouTube. We'll be back soon with more conversations about wellbeing in education.